you could develop full AGI in your system and it still takes 40 or 50 years for that to spread through the economy and change how everything's done. No, I really don't think so. China isn't that eager to allow all the potential of large language models to be explored because they have a lot of potential. That is extremely false. That's the most false statement I've ever heard you make, Robin. The first question is, who are you? And you need to explain who are you to the audience very briefly. Is this a, is this a philosophical or a practical uh, inquiry? Yeah. Um, no, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm Ben Gersel, I'm a, an artificial general intelligence researcher, and I'm the CEO of SingularityNet, which is an AI-based blockchain platform, and True AGI, a company building uh, AGI solutions for the enterprise. And I am an economics professor, <laughs> tenured. I don't have much success getting anybody to give me money or let me run organizations, but I just keep trying to look for original, you know, neglected insights that I can contribute to the world. And I will continue to do that decade after decade, as long as I can. That's who I am. Good. So where do you think is the intersection between of your work guys? Well, there is a number of, of, intersections to be, to be sure. So I, I actually, I began as an academic, as a, as a mathematician, which I did for eight or 10 years before entering a AI software industry, but that's not the main point of, of intersection. But I think we've, we've both been very interested in the future of technology and its implications for the future of humanity, society, and, and the economy, and so forth. And I'm I'm in the middle of putting the finishing touches on a a book called The Consciousness Explosion, which is sort of my take on similar themes to Ray Kurzweil's uh, Sing "Singularity is Near," but of course updated and with my own Gertzelian twist. But in one of the chapters in this book. I draw heavily on an article that Robin wrote some years ago on the economics of the singularity, tr 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 trying to look at what will happen to the global economy as machines, you know, take over more and more of the tasks that, that people do. So, I mean, that, that's, that's a concrete proximal common interest, but there's a lot, there's of course a lot of deeper, a lot of uh, deeper common interests as well. Right. I'd say, you know, our strongest interest is in this overlap of futurism and analysis of the social consequences of technology. Um, I was a technologist long ago, and then I moved to become an economist. And so I'm going to be looking at these things as someone who knows more of the technology than most economists would, but still putting it more in the frame of other parts of history, they know other technologies, what do we know in general about technology and social consequences? And Ben's probably going to be more focused on a particular technology he's been working on lately and the particular features and details of it, and then trying to think about those coming specifically from that rather than from this larger context. And uh, there is just a general way in which the world neglects this intersection. That is, most technologists don't believe social science exists. And so they tend to sort of make up their own social forecasts. And most social scientists don't believe the technologists that these technologies are about to happen in big, big time and make huge changes. So there's relatively few people who sit at this intersection of taking social science seriously enough to actually apply it to these things, but also believing there are really big impactful technologies likely to come relatively soon. Yeah. So my, my father actually, who you may have met briefly somewhere, Robin, but my, my father was a sociology. He's a sociology professor, started at University of Oregon, then was at Rutgers University. And he, he had, I'd say a long love hate relationship with his own discipline of, 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 of sociology. I mean, he began, he began doing sociology in a more, qualitative way. I mean, he began, he began as a Marxist, actually. He was denied tenure at University of Oregon in the early 70s for not being Marxist enough, even though he had published a textbook of Marxist sociology, right? But he, he, merely, okay. thought, he merely thought Marx was the most 
important social thinker ever rather than exactly correct on every possible point. Right. Now I remember wow. being, I remember going along with them to, yeah, the, uh, American sociological association conference when I was 10 or 11 years old, just cause I was a, I was a geek and was curious what, the, what they're talking about with socialist scholars conferences and so on. So I was sort of immersed a bit in, academic social science world. And I then also saw my dad become a sort of apostate to Marxism and decide, well, it's interesting. There are some real points here. It's also proven wrong in some ways. And, you know, we should be trying to evaluate things empirically. He then got into statistical analysis of, of social science data, which led to a discovery of how terrible it was and how almost all almost all published sociology studies purporting to use statistics to demonstrate something were just essentially examples of how to lie with statistics right i, I mean it was right. either it was just not nearly enough data or it was heavily biased data or it was overfit like one thing he discovered was overfitting was not considered a problem it was just a methodology like you just you just take all yeah. available data you fit a model that will map that data and you say, I'm done. They didn't even have the notion of like training on some data and testing on other data because there's not, they don't have enough data to do that for questions in sociology at, at, at that, at that point, at that point in time. Right. So then, yeah, I got, I got my dad at one point interested in machine learning and AI for sociology data analytics and also got him interested in, the singularity, and he then plunged into Ray Kurzweil's data crunching about will the singularity actually happen? And he 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 actually was reasonably impressed and figured like, okay, it's not all quite as solid as Ray claims on every point, but like by and large, there is some data driven reason to believe we might be approaching something like a singularity. But then when you get into what Robin mentioned and what are the social and economic implications? of, you know, the approach to singularity of, of AGI, of, of mind uploads, even of advanced narrow AI that can take a lot of people's jobs. I mean, we're not, it's hard to see how you have data to address that in a really rigorous way. And I see a bunch of what Robin has been trying to do, which is interesting, is find bits and pieces, like find aspects of the way out there technology enabled future that you can analyze in at least a, a slightly rigorous way using data, using, using modeling or using so something besides the, the, the seat of your pants. Right. And that's, that's a quite hard thing to do. So we're both in fields that have the following feature. That is the public hears from our fields, a lot of bullshit. <laughs> Yeah. And so the public doesn't know what to believe, but when we're in a field, we can tell the bullshit more from the others. And so that's a reason to be in a field where there's a lot of bullshit is so that you can actually figure out what's more believable. Uh, but then we have trouble convincing the world of whatever we find there because we're in these worlds where so much is not trustworthy. So that's why many technologists don't trust social science. And why many social scientists don't truck tech hype because there is an awful lot of unsubstantiated, you know, over hype of tech. So that's part of our obstacle here, even in talking together is to talk about distinguishing these things. One key issue has to be with respect to Ben that Ben thinks we're getting some really big changes really soon, not just in the next century or two, but maybe in the next 10 years. And we've heard a lot of people over the last 70 or longer years saying things like that and, of course, being wrong. And so, you know, the question is, what we can we from the outside believe then or should we? Or maybe the question then is just maybe, well, let's maybe give a low percentage to Ben, but he could be right. And then let's ask how should we prepare for a decent but low chance of really radical change soon? Yeah, in that regard, it's been interesting for me because I, I've been putting out there a fairly radical vision of the future 
for a while. And I've seen the mainstream progressively get closer and closer to my, to my point of view. So having this experience over 50 years or so certainly doesn't incent me to adjust my view toward the mainstream because my, my experience since the early 1970s has been decade on decade, the mainstream view gets closer and closer to mine. Like in the, so in the early 70s, when I encountered the book, The Prometheus Project by, by the Princeton physicist Gerald Feinberg, I mean, this book was saying, like, within our lifetimes, we may, we may get machines smarter than people, we may get nanotechnology, we may get, you know, technologies that will extend our health span forever. And the challenge is how do we develop this in a way that's for the expansion of human consciousness rather than just for rampant consumerism or other, other crappier things. And the question is, do we decide what to do with the, these amazing technologies that are clearly coming by some sort of global democracy or, or we d d let big governments and, and companies decide it? So I read this in the early 70s. I started talking to people about it. There was no World Wide Web then, right? So I, I found like exactly zero people who would take these ideas seriously in suburban New Jersey in, in the 1970s when I was like seven or eight years old. Then gradually AI became more of a thing. By the late 90s, you could talk about these ideas in some segments of society, like you had wacko organizations like uh, Extropy and so forth, which I, I call it a wacko affectionately because I was part of it, right? But I mean, you, as was I. Yeah, I mean, you had fringe organizations where you were getting dozens to hundreds of people to talk about these things, which was not easy to find in in the seventies or or, or or eighties, right? But now, now we're in a situation where there's trillion dollar companies. Now we're in a situation where there's trillion dollar companies out there saying, well, we may get artificial general intelligence at the human level within five years. And you're in a situation where leaders of major companies are, and major countries are formulating AGI strategies like nanotechnology, which people thought was batshit crazy when Eric Drexler started writing about it. Nanotechnology, granted, not yet molecular assemblers, but nanotechnology is major focus of research spending in, in many, many different co countries now with some real applications across different sectors. And, and the quest for human immortality, I mean, Google put pi piles of, of of money into it. There's a whole, there's a whole human longevity investment sector and VC funds that are, are just focused on that. So from my view, these things I was talking about as a kid in the early seventies, like now there's a reasonably wide swath of society, including many folks controlling large amounts of money and power who take these things seriously and are roughly aligned with me on, on timeline. Right? So now, now, Okay, Kurzweil says human level AI by 2029. I think, yeah, sure, sounds highly plausible. But you also have Sam Altman says many similar utterances. Some folks within Google and Google DeepMind are saying similar things. Even like I, I think Kurzweil's gap between 2029 for human level AI and 2045 for massively superhuman AI, I think that's ridiculously long because I, I think once you get a human level AI, it's going to master computer science and it will be able to rewrite its own source code and get to super intelligence in much less than 16 years. But even that notion is somewhat main mainstream now. And you have, you have parties in Silicon Valley with Mark Andreessen and the, the, these other Silicon Valley tech bros putting forth effective accelerationism, like the idea we should be, we should be advancing towards, toward AGI as quickly as possible for the good of humanity. So the, the fact that the world has gotten so much closer to my point of view over time, indeed, it has bolstered my already strong confidence that my way of thinking makes makes sense, right? And uh, I mean, not that I'm 100% certain of, of, of anything. I mean, we may all be, we may all be brains in a vat, just d deluded by, d deluded by fake, fake stimuli. But my yeah, my odds, my 
Bayesian weight of belief in my intuition has increased, not decreased. Uh, clearly, the stock market doesn't believe these claims you're mentioning in the sense that uh, if they believed it, they would prices would be very different. Obviously, most government commissions, most most everybody in the world doesn't believe these things. It's a more larger identifiable set of the world that you can find that does believe these things and they can find each other more easily. But I think it is fair to say that it is a contrarian conclusion relative to most people, I, even most intellectuals. I think there's there's a subtlety to the nature of human belief that the discipline of economics deals with poorly, which plays some role here. So I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to say that the majority of the Earth's population agrees with my intuition on AI or even the majority of the population of, say, the Seattle area where I live, which is a highly educated tech-savvy population. On the other hand, I do think people sometimes will have an intuition or feeling about something that they do not act on in the ways that you would think would be rational if they were consistent like people are inconsistent beings and i i, th I think that i think i think that you know if the singularity is going to come like people just don't know what the hell to do about it so like even if they well, even even if they think there's a 30 percent chance the singularity comes in five years they may be like well i'm going to conduct my life as if this is not true because i don't don't even know how to think about that 30 percent chance what where, where it is true well, so this is the question. Clearly, people are split often, and their words will express different beliefs than their actions. And then we have an interpretation question, which to believe about them. And maybe neither. I mean, maybe their inner, right? feeling, their inner feeling is not necessarily the same as either their words or, or, or their actions, actually. Right. So, like, in the last 10 years, often there have been surveys of tech CEOs, which gave very high probabilities of enormous AI changes. But clearly, most of those tech CEOs weren't changing their lives that much <laughs> in response to those predictions. Well, even so, the tech so, CEOs. so I'm, I, I'm, I myself, I'm undergoing a laborious process of building a custom multi-geodesic dome house here on 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 the island where I live. I worked with the architect on it, did a lot of work to get permits to drill well wells and, and, and all this. And probably the house we built in like a year, it's on a very nice property. But I mean, certainly you could say if Ben really believes a singularity that is likely to come in five years, like why why muck around with with Building a house, you can have all the mansions you want after 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 the after the singularity, right? And I, I think if if I look into my own mind, I don't think that's because I don't sincerely believe a singularity is say I don't know fifty sixty percent likely within five years, eighty ninety percent likely within ten years. I mean, I don't think it's that I don't believe that. It, 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 it's more that like in the case where the singularity does come having a nice dome house is not a problem. In the case where it, where it doesn't come, which is more than zero chance, right, then, then it's, 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 it's a nice thing to have. I also don't know that I make this kind of judgment all that rationally. I probably don't. Like building a house is a very emotional thing, right? Like I, it's, it's a lifelong dream to have a big block of woods and a bunch of, of funky structures in it, and you just do it because you feel like it. I mean, just like you choose to have kids because, because you have a passion for it and, 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 and you feel like it, right? I mean, a lot of these decisions are not rational. Now, you, you would say investment decisions should, should be rational, but we, we all know that's not the case, right? I mean, I mean, we all know like the, I mean, the function of retail investors is just to give money to, to give money to big algo traders and the big algo traders they're trading based on the quantitative models that they can back test but but you can't back test the theory of the singularity in any straightforward way I, I will argue that if you look at all the different segments of our society financial markets are among the most rational that's not 
holding them to a high rationality say like i'm just saying well but it's you look at, it's a strange, they're, they're, they're pretty good compared to a lot of other well things. but robin so I, i've done work in machine learning for stock and futures market prediction as well as cryptocurrency prediction and the, it's rational in a certain sense but under certain assumptions which make it very hard for the algo trading systems that dominate the majority of, of modern markets, it makes it hard for these algo trading systems to deal with radical change. Because I mean, you're when you're training a machine learning model, or, or even even like a, even a ridge regression model, right? Even a, just a statistical model. I mean, you have to historically backtest right, but- the model. So if and it's the nature of these trading systems is you can train a model to work well within a market regime, right? And no one knows how to make a model that will leap from one regime to another, and no one knows how to predict a, re- a regime change, right? So this this means- but all the, not all traders are running these algo models. There but are other traders it's like, out there. It's like 85, 90% of US equity markets, though. I mean, I mean, it's- Sure, it, but, but it's not a linear weighting of these things. That is, you know, the few people who disagree can often have an outsized influence because the other traders aren't, working against them they're just working off well, them. but the, if i mean this is a very technical topic which may not be our main focus here but i mean if the bulk of the mature markets in developed countries are driven by advanced algorithmic trading of various sorts then that's i mean that's the main thing driving the market then others right. are trying others are trying to guess what these algorithms are going to do, by, by, by and large, right? But in the rest of society, an even larger fraction of activity is driven by mindless conformity. No, 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 so. no, no, no that, that's, that, that, it might, it might be true. I mean, and it's driven by different algorithms that are trying to tell you what to buy based on what you've bought, what you've bought in the past and, and, and so forth, which, which also are overfit to previous trends, though, right? So, I mean, the, like the models, the models Amazon uses to tell you what, what to show you right. to make a link to click on. These also don't really price in exponential change, except in, in small ways. I mean, they may promote you the next phone that's not out yet instead of the last phone, but they are, they are based on your behavior in, 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 in the, in the, in the past. And they're largely regression models based on your behavior in the past. So we would seem to have a situation where a lot of the economy is driven by algorithms that need to be back tested on historical data and that are not sophisticated enough to deal with regime changes but and that exponential it's, change. It, it's still true that there are big piles of money out there who, if you said, I have a way of showing where these algorithms are wrong and how to predict the big changes that they aren't seeing, they would be willing to back you with yeah. enormous amount of money if they well, would be convinced you actually could do that. There's, so, there's a risk return balance issue here, sure. right? So, that, I mean, yes, if you could convince them that you could do that in a way that didn't have a very high variance, then they would be happy. But if you can predict something big is going to happen with a high variance, then in many cases they, they won't do that because actually most of the, most of those managing large buckets of capital in, in the economy now have a very, very low risk tolerance. And, and so they, they don't want to deal with wild future projections that have a high variance associated with them. I mean, the, and this is, there's lies about this, right? I mean, venture capitalists will always say that they'll always say they want some wild new outlier thing, but re- really, sure. re- re- really they want to maximize return and minimize variance like, like, of course. like everybody else. And, and the variance is high, right? Like, and this is something yep. that, that Ray Kurzweil must know in his heart because he's a very quantitative, rigorous guy, but he doesn't focus on in his books. Like, even if he's right that 2029 is the mean, like, what's what's the variance of that beta distribution or whatever it is stretching out in, 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 into right. the future, right? I- I'd like to return to a topic you mentioned sure, sure. about the potential for the world to get together to decide what happens with big technology changes. <laughs> yeah. It's because that's a good that's, one. I mean, I, I heard this very long ago, say first from Eric Drexler, who, you know, had this idea that if he could foresee the future, then he would should share that with the world so that the world could together see the future and then discuss together how to deal with the future. And it, 
it made sense and it's been a motivation for many futurists and many technologists to say, if I can see what's coming, let me get other people to think about this together to, to maybe not be blindsided by the future. And it makes sense, but over the time I've come to find the plausibility of an opposite hypothesis, which I'd like you to consider, which is when the world actually imagines a future technology that could have really big changes, and they believe that and take it seriously, they mostly just get freaked out and scared and want to lock it down and stop it. <laughs> That's how people reacted to, say, nuclear power or how people they reacted to nanotechnology and how they're reacting to AI today. It's not obvious that, in fact, the world's better off when the world knows about big upcoming radical changes. So I, I, my read on how the world is reacting to AI today as an example, is a little different from yours. But it's it's been interesting to me to see how everyday people, like my, my mom's friends who are like 80-year-old retired professionals or, or kids at the elementary school where my sister is a principal, it's interesting to me to see how these sorts of people reacted to ChatGPT and, and Claude and other large language models. And what I saw is like the first few weeks after they could try it, they were like, oh my God, this is gonna change the whole world. This is bigger than this is bigger than the than the internet. We're all out of a job immediately. Then after like a couple months of playing without it, they're like, Well, okay, you know, this might obsolete half of human jobs after some number of years of integration. There is real power here. On the other hand, it has this and this and this weakness that I can currently see. Like it can write a lot of poems but they're all banal, right? I mean, it can it can reason, but the reasoning is sometimes wrong and it makes up random stuff, right? So it seemed like ordinary people actually could see what the technology really is when it's in, in front of them after, not as quickly as me, like I saw that was at, well, it was after five minutes, but I'm an AI researcher, but after a couple of months of playing with it, they could see what it is. And I at least... Among the people I interact with, which is not just people in Seattle area, but my, my wife's friends in mainland China, people I know in Russia, in Ethiopia, in Brazil, who I work with through Singularity Net, within the people that I interact with, yeah, there's, there's an idea that AI should be regulated in some form or another. But I, I don't actually see a tremendous, like, fear that it should be locked down or, or, or banned or something. But I think this is an interesting case because there's a real thing that people are in, in, interacting with. And so with the Sophia robot, I saw something similar. P seeing the robots on TV or videos, people are like, oh, it's so creepy. These are our robot overlords. But I find when people interact with the robots face to face, they're actually warm and affectionate with, with, with the robot. They feel a little sorry for her that she can't move around better, but they also feel charmed and they want selfies. So it seems like when, when the real technology is there, very often the, the reaction is open. But the, the, the idea, what I find is in, in the West – quite different than China or Japan. In the West, a wild new technology, people's default reaction is, this will kill us all, we have to kill it first. In Asia, I felt like the default reaction is, yes, cool, this thing, this thing will, be, will, will be our friend. And so, that, that, so that, that, that is, it is, but that's about an idea, not about the actual thing. So if we look at, say, genetic engineering, uh, I have a lot of technology friends who lamented the fact that the, that the West sort of locked it down and basically prevented it from exploring a lot of things because yeah. of fears. And many people said, oh, but China, they don't have these fears, so they're going to let go wild with it. But China did not. China locked down genetic engineering as severely as the West, and yeah. it plausibly will happen in AI, too. China isn't that eager to allow all the potential of large language models to be explored because that, that, they have a lot of potential. That is extremely false. That's the most false statement I've ever heard you make, Robin. So, I mean, I mean the, about genetic engineering, you're, you, you, you're right. And, and there's a, seem to be, there seems to be a different 
psychology about things to do with the, with, with the human body, which is a sort of psychological, emotional thing about, about people. So when people are really paranoid about bra brain implants or, or longevity pill even, or genetically engineered food, like anything with the human body, people are just, are just uh, get a cr cringe feeling to, which doesn't seem to happen in the same way with AI or, or nanotechnology, but just on China. So I spent, I spent August in mainland China, in Shenzhen and, and Beijing. So there's been more than 70 LLMs launched by Chinese companies in mainland China in the year 2023. There's been more than 50 technical conferences with artificial general intelligence as a major theme in mainland China in, in, in 2023. So the, the Chinese government made a big shift after the launch of GPT-4. They shifted from being a bit paranoid about AGI to all of a sudden like completely embracing AGI and pushing in and wanting to be the leader of it. So like you, you, a few years ago, you couldn't get a Chinese NSF grant for something that smelled of AGI. Now that's almost all they want to give Chinese N NS NSF grants to. So they, they didn't like it because they thought they couldn't control it. But now, now the attitude is more like, well, someone's going to do it. So we better, we better be in, 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 in the lead, which is, is quite, so, it's quite interesting. Certainly, certainly in the West, the actual harm from large language models is almost non-existent. Yet people sure. are willing to consider very strong regulation based on their fears of what it might become. So it's one of those, again, the difference between how people react to an actual technology in front of them, as you say, people are often quite funny to it, and how they react to imagined future technologies, yeah. which they think might be coming. In those cases, people don't seem to react very well, which is then goes against the argument that we should be informing people about where things are going and so that they can democratically vote on an engagement. It seems like what they'll mostly vote on is, no, we don't want that. Um, that's not yet demonstrated, though, right? Like, those vo those votes haven't happened. Well, in, say, nuclear energy or genetic engineering, uh, you know, many technologies in the past, when people really believed that there were scary versions of them out there that might happen that weren't immediately, they were quite think, willing think, to go I think far. That's, I think it. that's true, but I, I think there's a difference in that AI has obvious immediate use for everyone and well, gives so did nuclear power i mean no it's not, it's, not, it's not it's not nearly i don't think it's nearly as obvious because you're not interacting directly with it it's, it's just coming out of your wall socket it, it feels just the same as any other source of power to 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 to, to you right whereas for, for ai it's like artists are using ai to make pictures and they like doing that and if if Siri or Google Assistant or Bixby becomes less stupid, people see that and they they're actively engaging with the AI in their in their in their life, and it's getting better. It's like mobile phones or something. People are using it all the time, and it's getting it's getting better all the time. And they're 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 in like what Martin Buber would have called like an, an I thou relationship with the, with the AI almost, right? Like they, they, they feel what it's doing and they can see it's getting better and, and more, more useful to them. So with genetic engineering, it, it, it's more like if new genetic modification foods were coming out every couple months and you were eating them, they tasted better than other food and they made you, they helped you lose weight and made you feel healthier than other food. I mean, then there's still a scary story, but like that Genomod food is doing you good and giving you fun at that exact moment in a way that's improving steadily over time. And that, that totally wasn't the case. And with nuclear power also, like if, you're, if your power bill was going down every six months because of nuclear power and you saw that you got to buy, you know, a cool new thing for your house that you couldn't have before every six right. months because power was getting cheaper, then I think the sentiment would have been would have been quite different. But but notice because we were so scared of these things and we regulated them, these things didn't happen. 
It's the regulation that prevents the scenarios you're talking about. That is, if we just allow them and then they benefit on us, then we'd say, oh, this is great. Let's have more. But when we look at them ahead of time and say, oh, that looks terrible. And then we prevent these things. Then that's when we don't get those improvements. And that could happen with AI too. We could be so scared of the future AI we envision that we will not allow the local changes that could benefit us. But I think in the case of AI, the cat is out of the box now, right? I think in the case of AI, it's already delivering palpable benefit to many ordinary people and, and business owners and artists and, 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 and so forth. Like, like, everyone would, even if they're skeptical of when Elon will release a self-driving car, like everyone would like to have a self-driving car. And the argument is now, will that really come in a few years, like Elon says, or it will be 20 years? It's not, will it come in 500 years? And not that many people want to ban self-driving car R&D. They want to control how self-driving cars can be launched in, in case it's pre premature or, so, or something, right? So it, it feels like because of the nature of software being different than dealing with nuclear materials or biological lab research, because of the nature of software, AI has managed to proceed by putting useful stuff that everyone loves out there before this dynamic and fear and regulation advance, <laughs> advance too so far, un right? Unfortunately, on, you know, on the table at the moment, through the process, are some pretty onerous, strong regulations of what they call AI. But that since the definition of AI is pretty vague, it could easily end up being a pretty strong regulation of just software in general. Yeah, but uh, they, they want a lot of prior approval, prior testing, prior notification, limits of applications. We could have that world soon, exactly because I, of fears I, of AI. I don't think it's going to happen, though. Yeah, I, I, I mean that that that, that would be. That would be fascinating and it would be very good for whatever countries were clever enough not to put such such rules in place, which certainly would, would, would exist. But, so, I mean, if, if that really happened, what would happen is whatever countries didn't put those stupid rules in place would attract insane amounts of investment and insane amounts of immigration by brilliant people would develop super smart AI technology there. And then, then the countries that realized they were being left in the, in the dark ages would retract Unfortunately, that. Unfortunately, that didn't that. happen with, with nuclear energy or no, genetic no, engineering. Because those are not software. Because software is very fast, right? I mean, you can, you can buy a bunch of servers and you, you, you can move a bunch of programmers and you can just port, like, like for example, Singularity, my own software company, I mean, we have... 150 people there in all over many different countries countries in in, in, the, in the world if somewhere out if if someone outlawed the AI we're doing I mean our developers from whatever country outlawed it would probably just all move somewhere else and we just keep going like moving a nuclear research facility or, or a genetics research facility is not is not that simple and uh, I, I mean the the ways of making money from those things were not as, as fast, right? So, I mean, I, I I shouldn't trivialize it because it's it's certainly important to fight against these ridiculous attempts to to overregulate AI. I mean, I mean, it, it's necessary that people are are fighting against these ridiculous attempts at at, at regulation. I just think that it will be so economically counterproductive and so bad for practical consumers that it's, it's hard for me to think that's actually going to actually going to happen. I mean, I mean, we did look, prohibition. Look, look in the like, US. It looked like Phidias had a question he wanted to interject or comment. Yeah. Yes. I was going to ask you, do you think zero regulation is better, Robin? I, I'm a, well, the, my comment was about the kind of regulation that happens when people envision a very different technology driven future thing, not just regulation in general. So I'm much more okay with regulation when people see actual concrete problems that happen in front of them. And then they want regulations that react to that and try to prevent those from happening again. That doesn't go as wrong as when people take some science fiction vision of the things that could go wrong and then try to generate regulations to prevent all possible versions of that. That kind of regulation I find 
much less valuable. Yeah, but Robin, let me take this in a, in a practical direction then, because you might or might not be right in, in what you said, that because the general public gets confused about stuff that's not real yet, we might be better off not to even try that outreach until the thing is real so that people who are more sensate and m more experienced grounded can then think about it in, in, in a sensible way rather than running away with, 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 with fantasies. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's an interesting argument and you can again get into the nuances of when it might or might not be the case. But on the other hand, in the world we have right now, powerful parties with a great amount of money and their own vested interests are going to the general public with visions of the future as related to AI. So then the question is, if you have a vision of the future of AGI, which is a little bit different from those of these powerful parties who are going to the public about it and who control a lot of what the public reads and therefore thinks, does it make sense to put your alternative vision out there or is, or is is that sure. just not worth it, right? Because because like, no, no, right. I mean, like That's we, very we different. like we don't have the we don't have the choice right now to tell Sam Altman and Elon Musk to shut up about about the future the future of, of AI. Sure. Many people have tried, right? So. Right. So once everybody's talking about nuclear genetic or AI or something else, then uh, you should join the conversation and offer your best perspective to counter what you see as mistakes. Uh, that's once everybody's talking about it, then we're just stuck in the situation where ordinary people are going to use their intuitive reactions to it. And that's what's how it's going to play out. And that's probably always where we'll be with the Internet, right? Because things things don't stay quiet very long. Well, but I mean, you and I know of many kinds of futuristic technologies the world has hardly t ever talked much about. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of things that are well, coming that people don't not, think much not, about. But they're not as obvious as chat GPT, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, once right. you, once you, but, but chat GPT was designed to be obvious. That is, it was a move to exactly make something that people could relate to. Yeah. And that would catch a lot of public attention. It wasn't a random technology that people happened to notice. It was designed sure. to get people to notice. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I mean, there are, I mean, quantum computing is an advanced technology, which is real. I mean, it's not yet commercially viable, except in terms of speculative investment. But it's it's a real thing. It's very very exciting, and that that people have sort of heard of it. But I mean, people aren't afraid of it, nor are they excited about it. Like people outside a bubble of tech and science enthusiasts, just aren't aren't. It's not especially on their on their radar. And growing growing neuroids in in a in a vet like little artificial brains in a ball. This has weird ethical conundrum associated with it. Like, could, could you make a little bunch of human neurons in a, in a vat, which is doing nothing but orgasming all the time or doing nothing but t being tortured all the time, right? I mean, th th again, this, this is sort of a weird thing that no, so one, is, that no one is thinking about too much, but these aren't, these aren't being offered for, for public consumption at this moment, right? So, so here's a trend that's related to what we're talking about, which is that over the last half century or century, the world has become much more of an integrated global culture. So a century or two ago, we mainly had a lot of competing nations, each of whom had cultures within that nation, but the elites of nations were allied with that nation. And now the elites in the world are mostly allied with a shared set of elites in the world, not so much with their particular nation. And so the world is generating more of an integrated global culture. And so we're having more of an integrated global response to things like the pandemic. So like in the pandemic, within the first few months, all the global elites talked together about what to do. And then most of the world basically did the same thing they all decided. And this is a trend with technology such that I think part of the explanation for why China didn't deviate from the rest of the world's behavior on uh, genetic engineering is that they crave to be part and accepted by the larger world culture and don't want to deviate too, from no. it too far on most on regulatory issues. My, and, my read on China is quite different. I mean, I, I agree with the globalization 
trend that you mentioned, but I think the Chinese elite is remarkably insular, and China is a very inward looking country. But and, nevertheless, and China doesn't deviate on regulations from most of the world consensus in most areas. If you look at, say, organ sales, or yeah. how they do airline regulation, just any regu- and random regulatory <laughs> area, China doesn't deviate that much. How about regulation of prisons? Uh, I think China is mostly trying to keep their prisons hidden, so <laughs> there isn't much. There isn't. We don't have much worldwide regulations of prisons, actually. No, uh, no, no. I, I mean, I think China has big advantage with things like regulating AI, actually, which is their their legal system is not really rule of law based, so they don't need to try to come up with very precise, wonky restrictions. Like in the U.S., we have to say, okay, we're going to regulate, you know, any machine learning model with more than 50 billion parameters. And then, of course, there's a way to work around that. Like someone will make a model with, you know, 10 million parameters, which are all eight-dimensional vectors or something, right? Or they'll right. make they'll right. make 100 different 5, million, 5 billion parameter models. So because of the way our legal system works, we have to pretend that we're paying attention to the exact letter of, of, of the law, even though we don't quite. In China, they don't make as much of a pretense of, of that. I mean, they do have a letter of the law, but it's more so, it's, it's more accepted like the judge so or the regulator goes by the seat of the pants and just does what, what makes so sense. Take, right? take the example yeah. of organ sales. Only one country in the world allows organ yeah, sales. Iran, and, Iran does, right? Right, yeah. Iran. It's the only country in the world, and it's there very highly regulated in the sense the government sets the price yeah. in, in the market. And bioethics conferences regularly meet and lament how are they going to get Iran to stop deviating from the world consensus on organ sales. This is part of our world's integrated culture where we agree a lot on regulation because of this yeah. integrated world culture. That's going to make it hard for people to defy world consensus by saying, oh, I'm just going to find some country that will allow it. For a lot of things, you can't find anybody who will allow it because most countries are eager to be accepted by the world consensus and the world elite community. And well, they aren't very willing to deviate and defy it. Yeah, I guess I feel like the regulations on AI even if they were adopted, would be fudgy, though. Uh, I, I mean, it's not as it's not as cut and dried as as selling so, your. So, so selling let me tell your, you something your, your about kidney, the, the history right? of software. As you know, uh, in the 1990s, the world, especially the West, introduced software patents, which didn't really exist before then. The spread of software patents allowed the software industry to be much more dominated by a few central players yeah. because they could create patent pools that they shared. And right. basically, most everybody else, in order to be valued in the software industry, you have to sell yourself to them. That is, you have to make a product and sell yourself to the one of the patent pools so that then, you know, their product can be used within that patent pool. And that allowed an enormous centralization of the software industry, sure. uh, which has continued since then. And AI regulation we're seeing at the moment is mostly looking like things that will support the centralization of the software industry, a bunch of rules that yeah. just formally can be followed. They don't actually make it much safer, but they make it much harder for smaller players to compete in the industry. And that's the kind of regulation I predict will happen. That is, the, the central players will like more central control, more ability to suppress small player competition. And like software patents, we'll have AI regulation that doesn't actually make it much safer or prevent problems, but yeah. make limits the players to being this few large there's, central there's, powers there's, who can share patents. They're certainly trying. So, I mean, if you look in, if you look in the music industry, I mean, the 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 the, the way that's been set up in terms of copyrights and licensing of various sorts. I mean, in the end. In the end, that has led to the centralization of the music industry, where Spotify and, and iTunes control and a few labels collect all the money. On the other hand, setting aside the money aspect, you have amazing peer-to-peer actual sharing of, of music on the internet. Like, I mean, it's easier than ever to record music right. and put it, on, put it online and, and, and 
and put it out there. And so that there, there is a interesting combination of these sort of peer to peer lateral right. decentralized dynamics with these centralizing okay. dynamics. And indeed going back to economics, it's, it's mo money seems a powerful tool for, for leveraging other factors to increase, increase, centralization uh, I, mean, I mean that's the, the the money aspect gets centralized faster than, than a lot of other well, other so aspects. the centralization raises the prospect of strong censorship you know for as you probably know yeah. public school systems largely arose so that governments could control what people thought sure in a centralized way and they've succeeded that largely that is you're free to speak how you like after you take you know all the years of schooling early in life, but that indoctrination has big effects and the government sure. gets to control that indoctrination. And AI, people are eager to control its indoctrination. That is, they don't want to let it just say anything that comes to its mind. They want to have central controls that approve the things that the AIs say. And that will be empowered by the fact that only a big companies are allowed to have AIs. So they'll be able to pressure the few companies allowed to offer AIs to the public to make sure the things they say are approved by so the authorities. I'll be curious how this comes out in the particular case of what I'm doing with Singularity Net and Hypercycle and decentralized AI. So what what we're doing, I mean, we're working on our own AI and AGI approach, which of course is one among many research approaches. Well, we're we are using large language models and deep neural nets, but we're, we're also using different sorts of systems. So these symbolic self-modifying knowledge graphs and so on. So we have, we have a new system called Hyperon, which is a new version of, of the OpenCog system I was developing before that. So just if we take the hypothesis that this works and leads to some AGI breakthrough, right? So then the way we're rolling this out is on a decentralized network. So there's, a, let's say, a large server farm in Paraguay. There, there, there's servers in Russia. There's, there's servers in various former Soviet republics in Germany, in, in, in US. We, we, we have stuff going on in Hong Kong and in e e Ethiopia. So some of these are smaller groups of servers. Some are like in, in Paraguay, they're building a huge data center and server farm right, right near right near the big dam on the border of Brazil, right? Then we also have these hyper PG boxes, which are just little boxes with a bunch of GPUs and CPUs in them. And we're soon adding some more custom processors. And we're just, they're $1,000 each, but we're, we're selling them to various random people who want to run AI in their house and then earn crypto tokens for running the AI in their house, right? So then, then what, what we'll have is an AI system, which is, it's not a large language model. So bands on training models with more and more parameters don't matter. I mean, it uses some, it uses some language models, it uses an ensemble of them, but it uses other things too. And this is running across a bunch of people's houses and then a bunch of, basically crypto mining rigs that have decided it's better economically to run some AI rather than just doing Bitcoin and, and Ethereum mining across many different countries, including some countries that haven't like in the for, like former Soviet republics that have data centers running mining farms and now AI farms, but that aren't, aren't necessarily the most cooperative players in, 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 in the global regulatory system, right? So then, then what, what, what happens if an AI breakthrough comes on this kind of decentralized network, which, which is what I'm, we're actually working on, right? And, and we, have right. A, well, we have a bunch of this working. So the, as you probably know, in the last few decades, the history of decentralized networks is that when they hardly matter or nobody cares, they're just allowed to exist in the margins and do whatever they do. Once they start to have more activity that affects larger, more centralized players, then regular authorities turn their attention to them and either co-opt them or crush them. Well, that is, 
So the question is, will your system get high enough attention such that people decide they want to apply the regulations that they're applying to the other big players to you? In which case, if you're trying to evade them with your decentralization, then they will be motivated to uh, try to f yeah. find and crush you, right? That's so interesting because like, I still email my friends in Isfahan and Iran all the time. So the Internet as a decentralized network. It, the Internet goes to Iran even though it's illegal for me to send money to Iran and you can get research papers from Sci-Hub and books from LibGen and movies from BitTorrent and all these things still exist. And, but they're and, on and, the and margin work, and they right? aren't seen as threatening the central powers. That is, you know, music sharing and movie sharing at one point seemed like it was threatening central powers and then they made changes to make those more marginal, which they succeeded at. And so those activities now it's, are actually it's, it, it's interesting because it's it's no harder to use BitTorrent than it ever was. I think just streaming services became better and and and, yes. e and, e and easier, right? But it's not it's not like using BitTorrent became worse. Now, what what you didn't see, you didn't see like a Netflix style interface to BitTorrent become right. become popular become popular though. M m maybe if you had, they would have crushed 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 that one hard, right? And maybe the because they're a bit wonky to use, that limits adoption, so nobody cares too much. I think with, with AI, with AI, so if we follow the thought experiment I'm pursuing, like with AI, right now nobody will care too much. We can serve a few commercial customers with this de decentralized network. Nobody cares that much in the sense that, I mean, Bitcoin and Ethereum are pretty big. I mean, you got trillion dollar blockchain economy and and that's, is heavily used for money laundering and so forth, but it's not been shut down by by, glo by global regulators. So that clearly, global regulators regarding crypto have been holding back, yeah, for a long time, and then they've been selectively stepping in on the things they think of as most large. And yeah, harmful. yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that does and so up. they will continue to do that. That is, as things get larger and in their eyes more harmful, then they will more selectively step in and stop stuff and. That's happening to crypto right now. That is, crypto is in the moment in a fall era in substantial part because of government larger crackdown, right? That's the history of the last year of crypto, roughly, is crypto is on decline exactly because government well, crypto has been is, stepping in more, right? I mean, in the last month or so, prices are up because of the projected launch of the of the Bitcoin ETF, which is, is a matter of regulatory Perceived likely regulatory approval and la launch of the Bitcoin e e ETF in in, in, in in U.S. Right. Right. So, so that, that's exactly. It all depends on the regulator's approval. This isn't some set of rebels defying regulation. This is things happen when the regulators approve, and they don't happen when the regulators don't. It's an interesting mixture because I mean, there's a lot of Russian mafia using Bitcoin for money laundering in and out of Russia too, right? So I mean, the, there's a mix of rebels defying the regulators and financial speculators following what, what the regulators do. For AI, AI, I mean, on the one hand, it doesn't trigger traditional regulations in the way that Bitcoin does. Like, it's not money laundering aspect or something. But, yeah, there's these new regulations. So the question is if, let's say there's a breakthrough toward AGI on some decentralized network a, a couple years from now. So, like, GBT6 comes out, then something even smarter than GBT6 comes out, but it's running on a decentralized network across 30 different countries and all these mining farms, right? And then, then right. I mean, what, what, what do you think, what do you think actually happens and with the governments of, say, Azerbaijan and, and Paraguay? I mean... The fact of the world of crypto is that even though it's in a decentralized implementation, regulators have a lot of ability to throttle the activity well, I mean, if they, they can, choose they can, to do they so, can right? Send, they can send guys with machine guns to the server farms. I mean, Chinese government did it a few years ago, and then, then all the Bitcoin miners moved to former Soviet right. republics, right? So. But So in the U.S., most crypto firms, their initial business plan was – we don't have to follow regulations because we're on the blockchain and regulations don't apply to us. But then they, you know, advertised themselves and had a headquarters and told people who they were and where they lived. 
And then pretty soon they were all telling, oh, we're following all the regulations. We're, we're not defying any regulations because they didn't actually have a credible plan to defy regulations because they, in order to do that, it's not enough just to have it on the block time. You have to have your people and organization, you know, evading regulators. Well, yeah, you, have, you can't just and that's declare your name and who you are, right? No, you have to have all anonymous handles, otherwise you have legal risk and, and so forth. Right, and but most that. crypto firms didn't do that. Most crypto no. firms, they're, and, and, they're and, people. And, and it's very hard. I mean, as you saw with yes. we, saw, we saw with Silk Road, I mean, Silk Road tried to do that because they were a sort of crypto marketplace for drugs and guns and so forth. And they, they tried, but they failed because the guy who founded it very early in his career had left bread it's hard to his do real identity. You, yeah, it's just one hard. mistake takes the whole thing down. And there's yeah. a lot of places to make it's, mistakes. That's it's, it's, it's right. Yeah. So the same for your AI network, right? Well, we're not, <laughs> Once uh, well, we're not trying, don't like it. We're not trying to be secret. We're very, we're very public about all this. We're also very globally spread so that in, in order to, in order to move our network into a, purely like underground rebels regime, you would need the governments of basically every country to crack down on AI in a coordinated way. Now, if, if that happens, then yes, the way for such a network to persist would be as a purely peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network of people running parts of the AI in, in their own homes. And that that's much inferior just from a technical standpoint to having server right. farms involved, right? I mean, it's not... It's not exactly a non, it's not a non-starter, but it certainly it certainly sets you back by by years not having tightly connected right. servers in a rack. So I mean, obviously, the first question is if you have some technical breakthrough, can the other big players figure it out and copy it? Yeah, but or it's will not, it somehow be limited to your no, system? No, they right? can they can copy it, but there's a time lag there. Like you see that you see that Google and Facebook have not figured out how to copy GPT-4 yet. BARD is much stupider than GPT-4, even though Google, right. even though Google invented... <laughs> it's only been a year, so... Well, right, right, but what's interesting is Google invented transformer neural networks, which is a key technology right. underlying GPT-4, and they have an incredible brain trust of AI geniuses, and their business is AI, but they still haven't managed to make right. Bard not be kind of a piece of shit compared right. to but, other things, right? So, the, so the, the, my, my point is, yes, yes, they can copy. On the other hand, you're de at that point, your decentralized community is moving is moving the, really fast, right? So, so the, no, no, the economics of this is that none of this matters until it penetrates the rest of the economy and allows people, the rest of the economy, to change how they do jobs and tasks yeah. and get profits from it. And that has long time lags. So the fact that you can do something faster than Google or something, if, if it just takes many years for these things to penetrate and get into changes, then your advantage doesn't give you that much. What you need to do is have an advantage on players and actors who you can make change things fast. Well, Those are the may, ways your fast times give you an advantage. It may give you, I mean, it depends on how much of an age. Think about self-driving cars, right? Yeah, you can yeah, have better yeah. self-driving car software, but unless you can get some set of cars to actually implement that software in their car and sell them to people, you don't get an advantage from that. So there's a lag in that the application of self-driving cars. I mean, I, mean I think... Right? I think yeah, if you're talking about a breakthrough that has that gets you actually to a human level AGI, then it's unclear how well this logic holds in the, the human level AGI. I mean, for, for example, just setting a human level AGI connected with all the world financial systems. I mean, perhaps you could just make. A collection of a, a collection of hedge funds that accumulates trillions of dollars. As, by, you, by trading, as you probably right? know, yeah. uh, hedge funds are one of the worst applications for AI in the last few decades. AI has made very little progress making well, progress I, 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 in the I, financial I, markets. I understand that, but but if you had an AI which is tremendously smarter than everyone else's, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. I mean, the the level of tools used in the financial markets has increased only right? if. You have one organization that has that and none of the others do. If a number of players in that thing have the same abilities in parallel, it doesn't give the overall market much advantage. 
It's true. Yes. They don't make that much. They can't make much money by having a 10 of them all have no. the same abilities competing with each other. But that you doesn't can, work. But you can make a lot of money in the year while others are trying to catch up with you. On, on the if you are the one with yeah. an advantage, Correct. maybe. But again, right. yeah. AI hasn't worked for well in financial markets. So it's not a good, it's not a good market. And it's anyway a pretty small fraction of the economy. It is. Uh, the big thing about AGI is going and changing a lot of jobs and making a lot of firms change how they do things to make to use the technology and make a lot of money, that has a lot of lags. I mean, I, that I, is, I, I don't think it makes sense to look at where AI has made money in the past as a model for where we'll make money in the future, though. I mean, like AI hadn't made much money in creative arts until suddenly you had generative AI making images and music and 3D it's animation. It's making the images, but a lot of making a lot of money there. <laughs> well, the, 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 the companies selling generative images are not making a lot of money in this market. It's not a huge revenue gain. Well, the, they're affecting a lot of behavior. Sure. They are. Yeah. That's not a profit center. <laughs> There's so much competition. There are so many different competing image generations that no one of them can really charge a very high price for the the advantage they have. Yeah, it, de it depends if you're talking about making your AI impact the economy dramatically, or if you're talking about sucking profit into into your 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 company. And I guess I'm I'm a bad capitalist in the sense that I don't. I mean, sucking money into my company or my companies that I have now, it really only interests me insofar as I can use the money that was sucked in to build other super cool tech technologies. And I mean, I think that doesn't stop you from making money. I mean, I think Elon Musk's view is roughly the same. And he, he's accumulated shitloads of money for his companies and himself, even though his main interest in accumulating money is to use it to develop more cool stuff, not to accumulate more money and, 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 and sit on it. But yeah, I, I think, I think because AI technology is qualitatively changing the sectors in which it will be able to have a huge impact. I mean, they will be different than right. the ones where it had huge impact historically. I, I do think you're right that where, I mean, where physical stuff is involved, there's, significant time lag, right? Like automating McDonald's or something. I mean, if, if I made a machine tomorrow that was affordable for the average McDonald's franchise, I would let them replace all their fry cooks. I mean, it still wouldn't take three months for every McDonald's to fire all their fry cooks, right? It would just, even if the machine was affordable, it would just take some time to propagate because of the way that industry works. I mean, just like, you know, dealing with the guy behind the McDonald's drive through window was a solved problem. And, and uh, I mean, that still hasn't rolled out across most McDonald's drive throughs in the U.S., even though it's solved and has rolled out in some McDonald's in some regions of the U.S., right? So, I mean, these, these, right. so these, these, imagine these, things, the scenario. these things do take a while. Yeah. Right. You could, you could develop full AGI in your system, and it still takes 40 or 50 years for that to spread through the economy and change how everything's no, done. No, I, I doubt, I, 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 I really don't think so. No, I, I, I think that once you've developed human level AGI, that human level AGI will master computer science, AI, hardware engineering, mathematics. It will be able to develop even smarter AGI, which will be able to develop even smarter AGI. And then before so, long, so before, you've got a foam scenario. <laughs> before long, you will have drones delivering Drexlerian assemblers to everyone's everyone's backyard. Then the dynamic that you're describing does not does not apply apply anymore. Okay, so you're now instead of imagining a technology that diffuses through the economy, you're imagining some core of the economy that can self improve yeah. without the needing much of the participation of the rest of the economy. And then Certainly. you're imagining that core doing a very rapid self improvement. And I think yeah, that we need happen. to think through what's in this core because I don't think there is such a core that can improve really rapidly compared to the rest of the economy. I don't know that well, that exists. There, there isn't right now, and we don't have a superhuman AGI right now either. I mean, the the nature of that core is 
relatively clear. I mean, in the sense it will be AGI systems running on computers and the, and the AGI systems will be most likely building factories that, that then factories build automated devices, which then build more automated devices. And y yes, yes. There's a lot needs, of trial and error involved in factory building. Factory design and implementation because, 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 can't be done all in the abstract. Because it cannot be done by us in the abstract now because we're not able to make adequate computer simulations of them. Why are you so confident that an AI five times as smart as us won't be able to solve this in simulation and then put it into the real world? Because it doesn't look like within a factor of five of doable. That is, these are intractable problems. We've we've improved our factory designability a lot more than a factor of five over the last two centuries, and we never got to a point where we can just do it in our Int heads. Intelligence, well... Intelligence multiplied by a factor of five is hard to define because we don't have IQ tests yeah. that even work for humans, let alone superhumans. So, but but I, I I I think that AIs significantly smarter than people are a very big qualitative game changer, such that the but, limitations you're you're thinking of are not. I'm, I'm willing applicable. to grant a lot of uncertainty, but I I'm skeptical that you could have much confidence in knowing what. AGIs are capable of and which problems are easy or hard for them. That seems like that's something they would know, but we don't know. Well, of course, it's easy to say that we don't know about something that hasn't been built yet. And I mean, we're, we're so far clearly from the maximum limit of intelligence that can be created within the laws of physics, even just going to molecular scale engineering, let alone femto or, or ato engineering. I, I, I guess fundamentally you're more skeptical of the intelligence explosion than I am. And I, I have extremely strong intuition that once you have an AI at the human level, it will be able to self-modify itself so vastly so beyond the human level. Now, I, 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 I will give you point out. No, we, we don't know exactly what the limitations will so, be. So here's, here's a key fact, a, a key fact to focus attention on, which mm -hmm. is for the last century, even farther, when we had a new breakthrough with computers or automation, there was a, always a substantial fraction of people who thought we must now be pretty close to human level abilities. That happened over and over again for a very long time. And now when we look back, we think, how could they possibly have thought we were close to human level abilities in, say, the 1960s or the 1980s? But from that point of time, they couldn't see all the things that happened afterward. And, and it really was quite compelling consistently over time. People said, now that we've got this, we must be close. And of course, that's what's happening right now. And it seems to me that looking from a distance, we got to say, you can't be very confident we're that close just because we've had this new development that was much better than what we had before, because that's what's happened over and over again for a very long time. Every decade, we've got dramatic new abilities that were make us are much better than what we had before. They're exciting and that open up new potentials. And each time people said, wow, we're probably close. And I just think well, we're probably not close again. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I would I'm happy to place a large bet again against against you on the, on this point but uh, I, I, I mean, which I know you're, you're into but uh, I mean of course we can't we can't know I mean there's many there are well-worn historical examples I mean people tried to fly in the sky many times and it, they couldn't and they made pedal things and flappy bird wing things and then they couldn't do it they tried over and over and then Finally, they did. Finally, it. they could. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's how it happens. We try and try, and and fail and think wrong things, and then someone gets it right. But I do think Kurzweil's basic argument has some interesting heft to it, in that he's it's crude, but it's is grounded in some way. He's looking at what appears to be the processing power of the human brain, and. You know, we don't know for sure. The brain could be a quantum gravity supercomputer, like Penrose says. But if we just look at mainstream neuroscience, what processing the brain 
appears to be doing, right? I mean, then... But, but we, well, that's well, not well, enough to give you the intelligence explosion. Like, saying that eventually we'll have human-level intelligence doesn't tell you that once you have that, you'll be able to suddenly accelerate no, into no, massive no, it, 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 it doesn't give it us that. That's, that's just basic logical reasoning but get that does get that does get you to, to it does get you to to human level intelligence so then yeah once once you're at human level intelligence i mean then looking at historical precedent doesn't really tell you very much except of course if you want to look at a historical precedent and say People are often wrong, and you're a person. Therefore, you, you may be wrong. Of course, you can say that. But so, I mean, so the, the, the point is, what, once you get to once you get to human level intelligence, you don't just have an artificial human. You have an artificial system as smart as a human that a can be copied a large number of, of times and experiment with, and b is can be instrumented so that you can observe the dynamics that are happening inside of it and study that and see that you know how it was created and to a significant extent how it's operated, all, all of which are advantages, and you can modify it as you wish without right. breaking it, all of which are big advantages that human brains sure. d d but don't, don't right have. Right now make, we which, have human knowledge of intelligence. That doesn't allow us to improve humans very well. Because we can't take okay, it We don't understand because, them, right? Right, but, but an AGI with human level intelligence will not be opaque. We can study the execution well, traits of the program. Large language models at the moment are transparent, but still opaque in the sense that you can look at any one detail, but that, that makes it much very hard to understand that things can be just well, really complicated. They can, so even though you but, can, then, but then wait. you can study that. So for, for example, there's a recent paper showing a, a function of the activation state of an LLM that lets you predict whether it is hallucinating or not when it so, says so something. Uh, let right? me remind and, uh, our and listeners and, of one fact that you know and, and all software people know, which is that most large software systems, even though they're all completely transparent and every bit can be read and they are, can be perfectly preserved, they still rot over time. And the main reason they rot is because they become fragile and hard to modify. They become harder to understand and modify, even though every piece can be seen. This is the fact of all large software systems. And so typically, all large software systems are thrown away and replaced with smaller, simpler ones repeatedly over time, even though they're all completely transparent. So that Transparent doesn't make them easy to modify and no, understand. But they this get gets, harder. This gets into technical points. So, I mean, for, for my own AI work, we're doing everything using functional programming languages, which have a clear mathematical semantics. So you can formally verify they fulfill their specifications and you can map them into into logic systems to do formal inference about what they're doing. And this has not but, been the, it's not sure, been the, but, but the, the practice. I've, the I've worked industry. on yeah. systems that had functional programming languages and system that has formal specifications. Yeah, they yeah. still rot too. Large systems rot in general, even when they're based on formal specifications well, and functional programming languages. So you have, no one has experience with the combination of large language models for automated code generation with functional programming and, and formal verification, actually. So there, there's new programming uh, paradigms. I'm, I'm, I will confidently bet that those will still rot. <laughs> but they can, rot is such a robust phenomena in software that but they these can, systems will rot as well. But they will self-repair because the, L, the LLM has a semantic understanding of what the software is doing and why. Self-repair is not enough. That is, Repair gets slowly more expensive and harder in rotting sure. systems. This is true not just for software. It's true for biological systems. This is how our bodies age, is they slowly get harder to repair. Even though we have all these repair systems working to repair them, they get harder to repair and slowly gets more expensive to repair. And eventually you quit and you throw an old body away and you start with a new one. Yeah, I mean, solving that problem, of course, is an objective of rejuvenation biology, which I think is also possible, but it's a, it's a harder problem than solving it for engineered AI systems, of course, because you're, you can't rebuild from, you're not rebuilding a body from scratch, right? I mean, rebuilding, rebuilding a body from scratch to self-repair would be easier than, than, than 
tweaking uh, evolved human to, to, to people solve have been for trying for decades to find ways to build large software systems so that they don't rot and they have consistently failed. It I, agree, agreed. They, they right. didn't have modern AI systems in. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we're nearing the end of our yeah. time. Uh, Phidias, do you have any last question or comment you'd like to introduce? Yes, uh, I'm curious to hear, uh, to understand better. So I'm not sure if you guys disagree on agree a lot of things. Uh, and uh, if you just disagree on the timeline. It's on purpose, you know. We're trying to be <laughs> unambiguous about this. <laughs> we're subtle, right? Simple-minded people, it's easy to see if they agree or disagree. But people with subtle opinions, why it's <laughs> harder to tell whether they agree or disagree. Yeah. That's a cost of subtlety. So do you agree or disagree? You can tell me to understand. On what? <laughs> on what point? I mean, We agree so on that, a great many things, certainly. We agree on the importance of this topic, on how techno radical technology is coming, how it will matter for the world, how some people need to think about it carefully. These are things we agree on. I mean, another, another, another point there is we are both explicitly probabilistic thinkers. So, I mean, if we disagree on something, it's always placing a different probability weight rather than anyone being absolutely sure, sure of what's going to happen. And we're both rational enough to hear that when we say something and somebody else seems to disagree with it, we immediately they <laughs> become a little less sure of what we just said. That is, the disagreement is hard to catch exactly because we're walking away from it as we encounter, you know, pressures well, against our view. That's because I have some respect for your thinking. For some people, if they disagree with me, it increases my, my faith that I'm correct. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say, guys, that this was an absolute pleasure for me to hear two great minds and you have different uh, kind of opinions about this thing. So this was, I think, the best AI debate that I ever heard. And thank you for your time. I love you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thanks, thanks for hosting us. I wish we'd gotten a little more back and forth from you, but your internet wasn't working. But I think, I think it came out, came out quite well anyway. So. Yes, you are a lot cleverer than me, so it does, it's not a problem that I didn't participate. So thank you guys again. <laughs> All right, yeah, th th All right. Th thanks a lot.